hello everyone, as you've heard, I'm Lee Midlane, the proud founder of IT Central, a forward-thinking IT solutions provider based here in Elgin. Our journey began in September 2015, born from a blend of necessity and also a vision. After my previous workplace, uh, an IT shop closed down, I saw both a challenge and an opportunity. With a diverse background that spans teaching, elderly care, and even a stint as a self-employed chocolatier, I've always embraced versatility and innovation. This eclectic mix of experiences not only shaped my entrepreneurial spirit, but also deeply influenced IT Central's ethos. At IT Central, we take a path less traveled in recruitment. We don't just look for skills, we look for mindset. In a constantly shifting tech landscape, we believe that the right attitude and a willingness to learn far outweigh conventional qualifications. This approach stems from my own life's journey where adaptability and a thirst for learning have been constant companions. Today, I'm excited to share with you how this philosophy has not only shaped our team, but how it also continues to redefine the way we think about talent and potential in the tech industry. Next slide, please. Thank you. Oh, well done. Um, we were meant to nod, that's why. When we first set out to build our team, we encountered a surprising challenge. Our initial attempts to recruit trained IT technicians was met with disappointment. The applications we received were underwhelming, to say the least. It was a stark realisation that having a technical qualification on paper didn't necessarily translate into real world competence or the right attitude for our work environment. One striking example was a candidate with a degree in computer science who astonishingly had never had his hands inside a computer. This con uh, contrasted sharply with the calibre of apprentice candidates we encountered, young, eager to learn, and unburdened by rigid, outdated methods. These individuals brought a fresh perspective that was more in line with our dynamic needs. It became clear that the traditional educational pathways were not adequately preparing individuals for the practical realities and demands on our part of the tech industry. This gap between academic learning and practical skills led us to an important decision to take charge of skill development in-house. Next slide, please. Our approach to recruitment and training has been significantly influenced by Jim Collins' philosophy in his book, Good to Great. Collins emphasises the importance of getting the right people on the bus and then finding the right seats for them. This resonated with us profoundly. In a small team like ours, every member's contribution is crucial and there's little room for misalignment. We learned that it's not just about filling a position, it's about finding individuals who share our vision, ethos and passion for continuous learning and improvement. This philosophy guided us to shift our focus from merely evaluating technical skills to assessing a candidate's adaptability, problem solving abilities, and most importantly, their mindset. We began to value curiosity, a willingness to learn, and a collaborative spirit above all else. This pivot in our recruitment strategy has not only enriched our team with diverse, dynamic individuals, but has also fostered an environment, environment where continuous learning and adaptability are at the heart of everything that we do. Next slide, please. Our recruitment journey at IT Central has been shaped by several pivotal moments, one of which stands out distinctly. It involved an apprentice in his 40s who struggled with the dynamics of being supervised by a much younger, yet more experienced staff member. Despite the younger leader's four years of IT experience, the apprentice couldn't look past the age difference. This situation escalated to a point where the work environment became tense and uncomfortable, culminating in a regrettable incident of misconduct. This was a turning point for us. It highlighted the critical importance of not just skills, but the right mindset and team dynamics. In response to this, we refined our recruitment process. We introduced a more comprehensive interview approach, coupled with practical work trials. These weren't just to assess technical abilities, but to observe candidates in a real world setting, how they interact with the team, they respond to, uh, to the challenges and adapt to our work culture. We started paying co closer attention to nonverbal cues, such as body language, which often speaks volumes about a person's attitude and compatibility with our team. 
The qualities we now prioritise in our candidates are honesty, friendliness, open-mindedness, curiosity and a strong willingness to learn. Honesty is paramount. We value individuals who can openly communicate and maintain integrity in all situations. Friendliness and open-mindedness foster a collaborative and inclusive work environment, essential to a close-knit team like ours. Curiosity and a willingness to learn are the engines that drive continuous improvement and innovation, qualities that are indispensable in the dynamic world of technology. By focusing on these core qualities, we've been able to build a team that not, is not just technically proficient, but also harmonious and resilient. This approach has helped us create a workplace where everyone is excited to contribute, grow and face new challenges together. At IT Central, our approach to skill development and team growth is as innovative as our recruitment strategy. We embrace the just-in-time learning approach, which is both dynamic and responsive to the immediate needs of our team and projects. This method allows us to stay, to stay agile and up-to-date in an industry that is always on the move. It's about learning the right skills at the right time, ensuring that our team is always equipped to handle the latest challenges and technologies. Central to this learning approach is our robust peer support system. We fostered a culture where knowledge sharing and collaboration are not just encouraged, but are part of our daily practice. More experienced team members mentor newer ones, creating an environment where learning is a continuous shared journey. This not only accelerates skill development, but also strengthens team bonds and ensures a cohesive approach to problem solving. A key element of our culture at IT Central is our commitment to thoroughness and quality. We don't cut corners and we ensure that every job is done to the best of our ability. This commitment is deeply ingrained in every team member and is a significant contributor to our strong reputation. Our customers know that when they come to us, they can expect nothing less than excellence. This reputation for quality and reliability is not just a point of pride for us, it's a testament to the skills, dedication and integrity of our team. In our pursuit of excellence, we've encountered a notable challenge in diversity, particularly the underrepresentation of women in our field. In the eight years since our inception, we've seen a disappointingly low number of female applicants, just two. This isn't just a statistic for us, it's a call to action. We are actively seeking to attract more women to our team, not just to balance the scales, but because we believe diverse perspectives fuel innovation and creativity. Our approach to diversity extends beyond gender. We have a higher than average number of team members that are dyslexic or have ADHD. Our industry naturally attracts people on the autistic spectrum. This has been a learning and enriching experience, teaching us the value of understanding and supporting individual needs. We don't just promote diversity by diversity's sake, we focus on promoting people. Our goal is to create an environment where every team member, regardless of their background or challenges, feels valued and supported to reach their full potential. We tailor our support to each individual, recognising that everyone's journey and needs are unique, whether it's providing flexible working arrangements, tailored learning resources or just a listening ear. We strive to ensure that every member of our team has what they need to succeed. This personalised approach has not only strengthened our team, but also reinforced our commitment to being an inclusive, supported workplace where everyone can thrive. Looking ahead, IT Central remains committed to a mindset first approach in our recruitment strategy, a philosophy we will uphold even as we seek candidates for higher level roles. We believe that the right mindset is a key driver of innovation and success, transcending traditional metrics of experience and education. Our focus will continue to be on individuals who are adaptable, eager to learn and align with our core values and culture. Next slide, please. I invite you all to ponder this. In an industry as dynamic as technology, how can we redefine recruitment and upskilling to not just keep pace with change, but to drive it? Mm -hmm. Let's challenge ourselves to think beyond conventional qualifications and consider the immense potential that lies in a diverse, adaptable and continuous learning workforce. Together, we can shape a future where the tech industry is not only advanced in its technologies, but also in its approach to nurturing talent, 
are fostering inclusive growth. Thank you so much, Lee. That was a brilliant presentation. Um, having spent some time with your team at IT Central, I know it's it's very clear that you know your stuff when it comes to recruitment. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for that. Uh, I can see we've already had some questions come in, uh, so please do keep them coming. Just a reminder uh, that we will be, be putting your questions to the guest speakers after the final presentation. So uh, please just remember to include either the name of the presenter or their business if you've got a question for a particular speaker. Next up, we've got Bernadette Johnston, who's Head of Talent Attraction at Glen Eagles. Over to you, Bernadette. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And thank you, Lee. That was that was really, really interesting and a lot of um, similarities. Also in very, very different industries um, and different organisations and um, a lot of your content resonated with me. So. Um, if we could start with the first slide, that'd be fabulous. Um, as, as my colleagues at SDA said, I'm Bernadette Johnston, and I head up Talent Attraction for the Glen Eagles, both at um, the site in Persia and our new property in the townhouse. So um, we're in the middle here, we're in terms of size between the, the three presenters this morning. So we have just over 1,500 employees across two sites, as I said there, Glen Eagles, an 850 acre um, estate in rural Perthshire um, with 233 bedrooms in our hotel and a whole plethora of outdoor activities and country pursuits and then we have our baby the Glen Eagles townhouse which is just a year and a half old and um, right in the, the heart of Edinburgh on St Andrews Square with 33 bedrooms and it's also a private members club so two very different properties but both part of the Glen Eagles uh, family. The Glen will be 100 years old on the 7th of June and the townhouse will be two years old on the 6th of June so big birthdays being celebrated. Um, our family is, is, is diverse, as you can see from the slide there. We've over 50 nationalities across the two properties. So a real spectrum of cultures and uh, the talent, the specialisms, the, the differences that, that our whole family brings is, is something we cherish. Um, our demographic is equally broad. Uh, the age profile in townhouse is younger because it's a, it's a newer property, it's a city centre property. But if I talk about Glen specifically, 50% of our workforce are aged between 17 to 30 and the other 50% are between 31 to 76. So the idea that hospitality is, is an industry just for young people is, is, is a myth with Glen Eagles. Um, we recruit for, me and my team recruit for over 50 different departments. So we have all the traditional hospitality roles, culinary, food and beverage, in particular housekeeping, rooms, front office, reception. Um, but we also have membership in both properties. We have golf with three championship courses at the Glen. Uh, we have an equestrian centre, we have a falconry. We have shooting, fishing, axe throwing, you name it. Um, in terms of outsiders, there's nothing that you can't do at Glen. Um, we recruit for wellness, technical services. So we have all of our own tradespeople, so plumbers, joiners electricians, painters and decorators. We've all our support functions, the people team where I sit in um, marketing and brand, finance, IT, um, you name it. So just, just to give you an idea of the size and scale of our operation um, and the areas that we're, we're recruiting for. So the people team, I thought it was important to, to stress that at Glen, we are the people team, we're not HR or, or, or personnel. Um, we're the people team because as point two says there, we serve our people and our people serve our guests. Um, and our vision and our purpose is to ensure our people feel as valued as our guests. And I'm not saying we're there yet, but we've come a long way in the last five years, in particular since Emma Simpson, our Director of People and Culture, joined us. Um, and as you see at the top there, we had a very clear five year people strategy. We're just at the end of year five now, so it's time to get uh, back to the drawing board. But it's about defining and um, so connecting our people to our purpose, our values. Our organisational priorities and, and making them understand that their contribution is, is vital to our success. Um, secondly is, is attract and develop. We are an industry leading employer of choice now and um, renowned for attracting and developing greatness um, and we treat our people as, as individuals and we give them the tools to succeed uh, so that they can realise their own potential whether that's staying within Glen or going away to London or the UAE or somewhere overseas and coming back to us. There's no such thing as a, a closed door at Glen Eagles. We encourage our people to, to grow with us and then and then fly. We, we give them their roots then we give them their wings as it were. Uh, the third part of our strategy is, is serve. As I say we, we recognise that we as a people team are here to serve the needs of our people just as they serve our guests. And we put their experience at the heart of every decision we make and every product we design. 
And then lastly, as a team, we we try our hardest to listen and adapt. And we listen to our people, we listen to our business, um, basing their basing everything we build on on their ideas. Um, as I said, as the, fourth, as the fourth point says, we are here to provide a genuinely service-led approach um, to what our people need and what our business needs. Um, and we adapt, uh, we build, uh, we, we've spent the last year investing heavily in our in our systems, for example. Next Monday, we're launching a new system where all of our people will have an app called Sona, um, where they can swap shifts, buy, trade shifts, and book their holidays, make all of their self-service adjustments, all at the touch of a fingertip. Um, and the beauty of this is all of our systems will now be talking to each other in a way they didn't, which again just enhances the service um, for our people. So that, that's just a bit of background about us and, and who we are and what we do as a people team. So the, the challenge we had, um, or we have had over the past uh, two, two and a half years, started with, with the COVID, um, as I'm sure it did for lots of us. We then had Brexit and then the Great Resignation, as it was termed at that point, which completely destabilised our labour market, which is mean for Glen, but across the UK um, in ways that we'd never appreciated before. Um, it really was for us coming back after COVID, after two closures and two reopenings, um, a crisis situation in particular parts of our business. We could no longer reply on, or sorry, rely on the pipelines that we'd used previously, and we really had to get as creative as we could. Um, a lot of our team had gone back to Europe uh, during the pandemic uh, to be with their families and most of them didn't return or with Brexit they couldn't return. They hadn't perhaps secured their settled or pre-settled status before the changes came into place. And then there's our location. The Glen, as I said, is in, is in rural Perthshire. Um, and the, the, the townhouse is right in the centre of entrance, it's a different proposition. But we found that getting people to come to us was, was even more of an obstacle than it had been before. Um, you can drive to Glen Eagles, we're on a number of major bus routes, but if you don't drive either of those things, it, it can be a particular challenge. Um, leading on from that, uh, we found that lower skilled workers and young people in our neighbouring communities that we'd relied on before as our pipeline were reducing their commutes, whether it be time or cost, whether it be um, cost of public transport, cost of fuel, um, and they were starting to take employment in, in other places. So Lidl, Aldi were, were big competitors for us, uh, cafes, care homes, garden centres, etc. Um, they weren't prepared to travel. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, in terms of experienced professionals, who normally recruit from London across Europe were, were staying put because of the, the economic situation, the political situation, um, visa set situation. Um, so, and further afield, it was becoming much more difficult to, to attract professionals too. Um, as I alluded to before, the, the areas that were affected most for us were culinary, so all of our chefs. Um, our budget for chefs is 110. Um, that's straight after the pandemic, we're less than 80. Um, and we have nine different places to eat and drink at, at Glen Eagle, so that was a real challenge for us. Um, housekeeping and our, and our food and beverage operation. So these are the, the big beasts of our, of our operation and, and the linchpin of, of everything that we do. And as I've said at the bottom, this situation posed the biggest possible risk to, to business continuity that I think we'd, we'd experience I mean, in recent times. So the solution, we, we mobilised um, as a people team, all 19 of us as we were at that point. Um, it wasn't a case, it was just a a talent attraction issue, the whole team came together and we indeed developed a, a bold, agile and multifaceted talent attraction strategy um, that responded to that crisis. Um, and just at this point, to see, we, we worked so hard, we actually won the HR Networks Award for attraction and uh, resourcing in, in 2022, um, which was a lovely kind of icing on the cake to the, the success that we'd, 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 we'd seen. Um, so we looked at four key work streams. First of all, accessibility, awareness, pay and early careers. Um, and I'll come on to elaborate on each of those. One of the key things that we did as well two years ago was secure our international sponsorship license. Uh, and quite rightly, the Home Office put us absolutely through a number of hoops to, to attain that grade A status as a license holder. Um, but it meant that we could then attract skilled workers um, from all over the world. Um, assuming we had a bona fide offer, assuming they passed the relevant English tests and and we reached the, the, the minimum salary, which at the minute is 26,200. And it's just about to go up if um, if plans are fulfilled to um, over £38,000, which brings another um, challenge for us, because that's that's out with a number of our roles, <clears throat> the majority of our roles. Um, 
where else we so we also partnered with a, an RPO, a recruitment process outsourcer, who um, drove that international recruitment and awareness for us. And we've now over 30 candidates in our business from over 20 different countries. Um, we built in a suite of employer brand materials to mark our opportunities to international candidates. We provided relocation budgets and we also provided um, complimentary on-site accommodation for six months. Um, I talked about location previously. We have um, a building at the back of the estate at Glen Eagles called White Muir, um, which was 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 tired, um, and we spent uh, three million pounds renovating it, and it's now beautiful. Um, we have every room is single, is en suite. Um, we have a large um, social area downstairs. We have a large laundry room and a gym. Um, and it's it's a fantastic retention tool for us, um, and it's only cost £250 a month, so um, that's well within most people's budget, and it may not be everyone's forever home, but at least gets um, people who are new to the area a, a founding, a, a setting stone, um, the opportunity to talk to their colleagues, find out where they want to leave. Um, there are no travel costs, the commute is a 30-second walk from the building to, to the staff entrance. Um, so that's made a huge difference. The only challenge we have is that we've made it so beautiful now that um, there's a lot of resistance to leave, but we don't ask anybody to leave until they're ready. Um, and it's a good problem to have. Uh, we also introduced a private bus service. Again, we were thinking of anything we could do to get people to. So we started two buses, one from uh, uh, that started in Socky in the hill and went all along the Hillfoots towns, and then a second bus from Stirling. So after the first year, we stopped the bus from the Hillfoots towns because it, it, it wasn't being used at all, but we're still using the Stirling bus. Um, and at a cost of three pounds each way. Um, again, it's, it's very economical and, and a large number of people are using that. And we can flex those times at Christmas, for example, when we put on extra services to get our people home um, Christmas Day, uh, New Year's Day, etc. Um, we also launched a cycle to work scheme. So um, hugely um, reduced price for bike purchase and then pay back over an agreed period. And we also launched a car share initiative um, across all of our both, both, both properties. Um, the next thing we did was uh, looked at pay, crucial to uh, or close to everyone's heart um, across all of those big operational areas that I talked about, and we increased the rates of pay for everyone, um, which resulted in significant uplift for the lowest paying roles. Um, no one at Glen Eagles now earns less than £25,000 on a full time equivalent salary. <coughs> having introduced service charge last year and sharing that with all of our people. So we estimate that at Glen Eagles, uh, our service charge adds on between four to six thousand pounds a year to an annual salary and in the city it's six to nine thousand pounds. So that makes a, a huge difference to our own target earnings. And we also um, advertise all of our salaries um, in, in every job. ad. There's only exceptions where we don't, um, but we're completely transparent. Uh, the third thing I've talked about here is a, a brand new approach to working patterns in, in restaurants and bars, um, giving greater service and shift patterns, really working hard at work-life balance. I think post-pandemic candidates were definitely looking at, as well as their well-being and their career progression, um, that, that balance and how much time they spend to work. Uh, so we've worked really hard at that. And all of our job ads, um, every single ad talks about flexibility, whether you want to come to be full-time, part-time for a career, for a seasonal opportunity, we're open to talking to about any opportunity. Um, we also signed the Scottish Government's Young Persons Guarantee. We launched the Glen Eagles Apprentice Programme, uh, the Glen Eagles Gap Year, and we also provided six month placements to um, 50 Kickstart candidates. We, all, um, what haven't, we also worked with Springboard as well very successfully. And we've also just introduced um, the Glen Eagles Graduate Programme this year, for which we are recruiting this month. Um, and a bit like Lee said, we, we looked again at our candidate journey. We, we, we've always prided ourselves on um, everyone, for example, receives a, um, an acknowledgement of their application and every single candidate receives a second um, communication from us, whether it's to say, we'd love to speak to you, come and screen with us, have an interview, or um, it, it's a decline. It's all about making the candidate journey as, as fantastic as it can be. Is that me? Is that my last that, slide? That's, that's you, yeah. yeah. Thank so, you. You're, you're, you're very you're very welcome and um, just to just to 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 recap again just on Lee's points the the key thing we're looking for in all of our candidates is is in alignment with our values and they're very simple about having pride in everything we do working as one team uh, warm and thoughtful and having a spirit of adventure so as I said like likely we look for those first the right attitude and then the technical acumen comes comes next so thank you sorry if I've overrun a wee bit <laughs> no that was brilliant thank you so much really really very interesting to hear how you've kind of 
really worked very hard to find solutions to those quite major challenges actually. Yes. <laughs> so, Thank, yeah, you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much um, and thanks to everyone again who's continued to send questions in. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to ask those after Graham's presentation which is up na next. So last but most certainly not least please do let me introduce Graham Butler Campaigns and Attraction Assistant Direct Director at EY. What a mouthful Graham. <laughs> In recruitment, everyone does love a fancy job title, but it's, it's, true. Um, <laughs> it is always the way. Well, incredibly uh, challenging acts to follow because those are really two fascinating um, stories, really, of different attraction and selection challenges in recruitment. OK, so I'm going to wrap up with a whistle stop tour of how EY, often known as Ernst & Young, the market, uses VR or virtual reality to help support our student recruitment challenges that we face. I think I just wanted to call out that I completely appreciate that all of us on the call know that recruitment in Scotland is hard, it is a challenge. I'm still yet to find anyone in the Scottish market having worked here for almost 10 years who tells me that recruitment up in Aberdeen, Inverness and Elgin is a doddle and it's a piece of cake. Um, I myself have worked across operations, technology, consulting, many other facets of recruitment in Scotland and have recruited everywhere from Galashiels to Elgin and Dumfries and beyond. So I can really attest to this fact of the challenge that we face. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with EY or Ernst & Young, we are one of the globe's leading professional services firms, covering everything from audit, mergers and acquisitions, technology consulting, and many more other services too. In the UK, for context, we employ around 21,000 people currently. Um, of those, just under 2,000 are based in Scotland across our offices in Edinburgh, Glasgow and Aberdeen, uh, and with a, a UK revenue of around £4 billion at, pounds at current market value. So we hire around 2,000 people in the UK into early careers positions. When I say early careers, we define this as everything from apprenticeships, internships and graduate vacancies. So around 2000 of those vacancies in the UK and around about 150, depending on market conditions across Scotland, which is my remit and what I'm responsible for at EY. Now, on average, we receive around 70,000 applications a year for those 2000 odd vacancies. So on the surface, you probably think to yourself, well, if you receive 70,000 applications, I'm sure it's it's just a, a, a very straightforward process of just funneling people from A to B and filling all your roles, job done. I wish it was that simple. I really do. Um, Amy, if you just gone to the next slide for me, please, that would be wonderful. And so for us, the main challenge that we face at the moment is how can we really differentiate ourselves in a really highly competitive early careers job market? Um, there's many other companies who are hiring similar positions that we are. Uh, the, 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 I guess the war or you know attrition for talent as well is really prevalent, especially in early careers when you're looking to attract um, top performing interns and graduates as well. And one of the things that we really look at EY is how can we make our early careers programs stand out? And one of the ones that we really identified was our summer internship program. Now, similar to many other companies who operate on summer internship programs, we use this as a key feeder to help fill our graduate vacancies um, across the UK. So typically for summer interns, Again, we'll take on just under 400 across the UK, across all of our business. If we get our summer internship recruitment right, this really feeds into our conversion on our graduate programmes. It means that we can go in to our graduate campaign having almost filled anywhere between 30 to 40 percent of our total graduate vacancy numbers. But what we really noticed was on our technology internships, we were seeing a really big drop off. Um, from those who completed the summer internship 
or didn't even choose to apply or were stuck in the process and actually converting them onto our graduate programs as well. And so what we wanted to do was take a very different approach to how we could solve this problem. And that is where um, a combined approach using VR and a, a brand new uh, augmented reality website that we created as well called Adventure Awaits came into play. Um, if we could just go on to the next slide, please. So a few challenges that we, we came across, and I'm mindful of time, so I will whiz through these. 15% um, of all workforce in 2025 will be Gen Z, which for us is really critical. So for those of the call, you know, Gen Z is typified as those born between 1996 and 2010. Um, this is something that we need to really make sure that we could really appeal to the Gen Z market because this was the key demographic that we were looking at. Uh, you know, again, staggering stats that 75% or three quarters of Gen Z believe that they should be promoted within their first year of starting a new job and 32% in the first six months. And that's from a, a graduate provider handshake that we work closely with who survey a lot of students. Uh, and we wanted our students to feel a real sense of connectivity to the business uh, because the Gen Z attraction challenge definitely links in with those having an impact on society at large. They want to be connected to the business. They're a hyper-connected hyper generation. They do value the work-life balance as well, don't we all? Um, but they were also open to being contacted by employers. And this is often what we found is that a lot of our former summer interns were getting headhunted as well by other employers. So what do we do about that? So we decided to immerse virtual reality um, into our internship. And actually, we launched uh, a fully immersive virtual reality internship with a, a third party provider called Capfinity. And this kicked off over a five week period, which was the length of the internship. And ultimately, what we did is we were able to embed a lot of our broader sustainability initiatives in our kickoff meetings to give students that sense of purpose, which was wonderful. Um, and then following on from that, we really wanted to upskill them as well. So one of the key things we did was um, did some immersive meeting school sessions, which actually fully hosted in virtual reality with the technology involved, where students could connect and meet in person through VR across different elements of the UK as well. Um, they were working on a sustainability initiative for a fictitious client that we created as well called Savanta. Um, and they, one of the things they really enjoyed throughout the process was they actually got to kind of do a presentation. Um, as you can see on week four, practice presenting VR with peers. We set up as kind of a Dragon's Den style approach where they had the music from Dragon's Den. They had to do the pitch for their project. And we actually had some staff who were acting as the dragons as well. Uh, and then what they were able to then do was really showcase the solution that they came up with to senior management as well, which was really, really important to us. And I guess the reason why we wanted to do this was that we identified the market for tech talent is incredibly competitive. Uh, the ways that we're working has changed and adapt, especially due to, I didn't want to say the word COVID, but it really has. We really noticed a loss of learning and, you know, just a real difference that a lot of graduates and interns that are coming in just weren't as work ready as they were pre-COVID times as well. But then also we wanted to really make a big song and dance about how we're doing something different and giving tech talent that opportunity to engage with tech uh, before they made a decision as to whether they wanted to join EY or not. The, the premise was very simple. To attract and retain tech talent, we wanted to embed technology into not only the process, but their whole internship they got a chance to, to be part of as well. And this is all kind of linked to us really trying to push our technology brand because we're competing against the hyperscalers, um, logistics companies, investment banks who are all looking to grow their tech function as well. And we actually saw throughout the process that this was a really useful initiative because our targets increased 92% for tech talent over this period. So it was a, a real um, a real godsend that we we're able to put this initiative into place just to make sure that we we're able to attract great talent. Won't go through all of these details now, but I think what we really found was, <coughs> excuse me, some really strong findings from the internship. Um, we really saw the students grow throughout the time as using the technology and collaborating across, um, you know, 
it really helped kind of push the needle on our brand. And, and also for us from the skills development piece, the number which I really enjoyed here is the 100% we're more confident attending meetings than before the internship. For some of us on the call, it will be quite recent for others like myself. And um, it's over kind of 20 years ago, I had to attend my first business meeting and I was absolutely petrified. No one told me how to do it. No one gave me any support or guidance. And I absolutely flopped, I think, on my first meeting in sales pitch. So for us, we do a lot of meetings in EY and professional services, don't we all, I'm sure. So for me, this this stat is wonderful that actually our students who are, took part in the internship felt a lot more confident being able to attend meetings and add a lot of value there. And then finally, if we can just jump on to the last uh, last couple of slides, this actually then linked in to our immersive um, skills development hub that we've created called Adventure Awaits, which really is a wonderful section of, of various things from skills development, so interview skills to things on well-being from you have a chance there's you know, there's yoga poses that you can learn as well as podcasts and playlists you can listen to to help support your mental well-being and also hearing from a lot of our summer internships and graduates and this is a, a really interesting product that we brought to market so if you do have a chance either on this call or after please do scan the qr code or follow the link there and type in adventure awaits um, it's just recently won an award at the RADS for um, a great diversity initiative, how it supports students from underrepresented backgrounds as well to perform better in the recruitment process. And again, it's something that we're we're really proud of. So I, I don't have time to give you a demo, but if you just go on to the next slide, Amy, it just shows you what the hub looks like. So when you click onto our website, you're greeted with this, this screen and then you can cl click into a number of different areas to understand um, and find out more about EY, but also develop your skills as well. So if you could just wrap up there, um, that is me. So it'd be great to connect with um, anyone else on the call on LinkedIn, but just want to say a big thank you for your time. And hopefully we are still good for time moving forward, Catherine and Amy. We are, Graham. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the presenters today. Um, it's great to hear from three different sides of businesses. So just for all the listeners on here, I hope that it resonates with yourself, all the challenges that no matter what the size of the business, um, we all have the same challenges. Um, there's been quite a few questions, so I'm going to come into that just now. But before I do, there's quite a lot of comments just saying thank you. Um, from the listeners as well. I know we don't have a chat function, but some people have started and ended questions just to say thank you very much uh, for the questions. So the first one I have here is, uh, and it's to all the presenters, is how important is it to have a documented people strategy? Um, and I think it's quite good to ask all three, just given the different sizes. Um, but Lee, if we can start with yourself coming from that small employer. At, at the moment, there's just six of us on the team, so we don't have anything documented right now. But this year is all about producing strategy documents. So it's something that we are going to put in place. So as we grow and we scale, we will have that. So I do think it's really important because you need to have that uh, consistency across the board. Great, thanks Lee. Bernadette, we'll come to you. Yeah, I would agree. I think I think it's crucial. As I said, when Emma joined us five years ago, our director of people and culture, um, I'm not saying we were rudderless. That's not what I'm saying at all. But it, there was so much to be done. You know, the the Glen was you know 95 years old. We'd had the previous HRD. Again, no disrespect for 25 years. It, it was time for change and and clarity and that thrusting forward. You know, I talked about that that fourth um, value of ours being spirit of adventure. So we might be nearly 100 and 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 two with the, the smaller property, but we, we never want to stop, but we always want to be adventurous and never complacent. And, and you need, therefore, something that's guiding you through that, certainly for us as a people team, to then share right across the business. So, yeah, vital, I would say. Thank you. Graham? Yeah, I, I completely resonate with both the previous comments. So I think even within our recruitment function, and I would say as an internal recruitment team, EY, is very sizable. I think we have almost 100 in our recruitment team across the UK, which is a, just a phenomenal amount because of, it blows my mind when I first, I've only been with EY just over a year, but it kind of blows my mind on that point. And on that basis, when you have that number of people, we do have strong retention, but the team that I work in, student recruitment, you're always going to have an evolution. We have people who go into different parts of the business and, and, and move on. And I think what we have, which I absolutely is my go-to for any new joiner, similar to, to Bennett's point is you've got to have that North Star. So we we have about a 50-page a playbook 
which really documents everything that we talk about from our people strategy um, and what what it stands for and what it means to be part of EY, what our culture is, what our values, um, and really to set a lot of our new joiners and you know existing employees up for success because often it's their first time joining a professional organisation. And it's really easy to get lost because EY is complex. I'm still figuring out a year in. (laughs) Oh, that's going to be online as well. Probably shouldn't have said that. Anyway, I'm still figuring out as we go. So, yeah, I think for me, it's, it's a real it's a real fundamental. The tricky bit with the people strategy is where do you start it? who who owns it you've got to have that collective buy-in and how far does it go i think as well and um, those are some of the challenges that we, that we look at when we're focusing on our people strategy great thank you very much um next question is and this is to everybody but how do you ensure your talent attraction strategy is inclusive to all equality groups and diversifying your talent pool so really thinking about i know we touched on it lee but um i'll maybe start with yourself graham just know so you were there first of all yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's it's really important. Um, everyone will say that. I think for us, it's making sure that you've got the level of compliance that required. You know, we partner and use rare recruitment, which is really fundamental to us to make sure we're open and inclusive. I think just if you take it from a very simplistic basis, when we look at graduate attraction and selection, often it's been historically a really closed market. There are so many employees of graduate talent who would say, you can only come and work for us if you've studied uh, a degree in accounting and finance, and if you have a 2-1, and if you're from this particular university. And I'm really pleased to say that EY, one of the first companies who um, dropped degree requirements from majority of our programmes and really opened up our inclusivity. So just from a, a degree perspective, we have students who work in professional services who've studied zoology and uh, other far, far, far reaching degree subjects, which again, hasn't always been the case, hasn't always been the case. So I think for us, it's about that, but also embedding uh, programs from the off. So great example, um, EY have a two day insight program, which gives, uh, which is specifically for underrepresented groups. So we have a social mobility and business program, um, a women in leadership program and a black heritage and business program, which really just helps support our inclusivity and pipelines, because we know if we just keep doing things the way we've always done them, we're never going to get anywhere near our ambitious diversity goals. So those are just a couple of whistle stop things that that we're doing at the moment just to really help shift that needle as much as we can. Great. Thank you. Bernadette, have you got anything to add? Um, I, I just again con- concur concur with all of that. And although we are the hospitality industry, there's no for a vast majority of our roles, there's no requirement to have specific hospitality experience, which, which opens the doors to, to everybody. And clearly, we have some roles that are are more technical or specific. You know, if you if you come into an equestrian groom or a, you come into handle hawks, then you need to know what you're doing. Um, but we are wide open, and and the, I guess the the, the key thing, as I say, is that alignment with, with our values and the attitude. And then we don't mind where you've studied, what you've studied, if you've studied, um, which background you come from, um, which industry you've come from. We get you in and then, and then we, we we take you through what you need uh, to, to progress. And as I alluded to our, our ads as well, you know, we, we're we inclusive in terms of work-life balance, uh, working patterns, um, family care. We've got a wonderful suite of um, policies called Moments That Matter, for example, where um, recognising all the different things that happen in someone's life, whether it's you're at the menopause stage or your first property stage, or I'm, I'm kind of wondering a little bit, but I guess our doors are completely open, completely open. Great, thank you. Um, Lee, do you want to add anything? I think we're, we're very much in a different category as being such a small business. Yeah. And I think our challenges actually start earlier. And one of the plans that we have as we get bigger is to actually start to have clubs for teenagers to come into so we can offer a, like a girls in tech uh, club that they can come into. Because unfortunately, girls have the peer pressure to walk away from tech when they do their options because they say, well, it's, it's not no, it's not something that we want to go into, even though they do, the peer pressure is there. So I think we have a responsibility to actually take it back to a much earlier stage to then encourage um, people of all different abilities and all different <laughs> grounds to know that tech is a viable option. And I think we've got a big battle to do that one. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, this is a question for yourself, Bernadette, and it says, with such a diverse workforce, ages and nationality, does this create any challenges in terms of communication with staff, shared values, staff inclusion, etc.? Um, I'm not being glib, but it, it, it doesn't. I, I kind of I, on a daily basis, um, our, our culture is, is, is hugely open, hugely communicative. One of the most fantastic tools we have is we use Workplace, which I don't, I don't know if you've come across. It's essentially Facebook for business. So we have <clears throat> work chat where we can um, talk, chat, you know, message, group chat, video chat on it. And then we have Workplace where it's essentially a, a, a feed of different posts. So we have all of Glen Eagles as a group. We have Glen Eagles um, in Persia. We have Glen Eagles Townhouse. And then every department has its own um group for posting and that's we, we communicate on it all day every day and particularly after the or during the pandemic when we were all at home most of us were at home and um, and a lot of our people were all at home on their own pretty isolated and um, we had the kind of the formal stuff so if every time the first minister um made an announcement corner or mdrm or our director of people and culture would then translate that for our people not in a, not in a uh, a, a patronizing me but this is what it means for us as people this is what it means for our business and um, through you know, that, that really formal stuff through to we had chefs doing right, what's in your cupboard we're all going to cook together tonight or our florist making you know a, a b hotels all sorts of things but it meant our people stayed as engaged as, as much as they wanted to for some of them it was absolutely a lifeline for some of them were like I don't want to see that again you know um, pet competitions you throw anything, anything with a pet and everybody gets involved so that that helps us on an, an all day everyday basis and then I think as a people team we're, we're hugely communicative we have screens for example in, in both of our properties you know t tv screens where we advertise our roles we advertise what's happening and um, all the inclusive groups that we have across um across both businesses so that's a bit of a long answer, but it, it doesn't actually pose a chance. Sometimes this technology side of it does. Not all of our people are, um, uh, most of them have a phone, but I'm, I talked about the app that we're moving on for to now called Sona, where we'll be managing ourselves. Um, not everybody has the, the technological acumen, but that's about the people team office is literally always open as well. So we have, as you approach our office, the door opens automatically and there's always someone on the reception desk. So there's still that that face to face. We also have um, some virtual people teams. So we have Ask Joy. So if our people have got any general queries, again, for a 24 hour day, seven day week operation, they can ask Joy. They might not get an answer immediately, but they'll get an answer from one of us as soon as possible. We have Ask Bob um, for our accommodation. If, if, you know, if, you've, if you've lost your water through the night or your shower is leaking. And we have Ask Me for our managers. So if you can't get to us face to face, there are lots of virtual options as well. Great, thank you. Um, this is one for all presenters. So how are your current workforce involved in talent attraction? So Lee, we'll maybe come to you first in the smaller business. I think a lot of it is just about how we are with people. So a lot of times people will actually approach us and say, do you have any jobs going? We say put in a CV and a cover letter and we do keep those on file. Um, so I think really it's just how we present ourselves, how we communicate with other people, then naturally attracts people to come in. Great, thank you. Benedict? Um, yeah, our, our people are, are vital to, to, to our recruitment. Um, we have um, a, a referral friends, we have a referral scheme system. So if you refer someone and they secure a permanent position after their three month discovery phase, you're paid £300. At times for particular roles, we flex up to 500 or 1000 So at the minute, if you refer, a spa therapist, which is always a tricky one, you receive a thousand pounds. So um, they, they, those work well. Even for our, our seasonal recruitment, if you refer someone for a festive package, that's a hundred pounds referral. And um, the screens I talked about, so our people can always see what the job of the week is. Um, our Glen Eagles newsroom, which is like our weekly virtual newspaper, we put a uh, targeted jobs on that. Um, word of mouth, you know, we've got sometimes in some instances three generations of the same family working at Glen, so the word of mouth is, is really really strong. Um, local schools, uh, we're really uh, great relationships with them and the lo still in university, for example. So I guess word of mouth is 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 big. But yeah, I mean, we also do a job shop every Friday in workplace. So again, we're highlighting our key roles. Um, so yeah, yeah, our, our people are vital and they're rewarded for it too. Great. Graham? Yeah, I, this is very prevalent, actually, because we have just relaunched a new initiative, well, relaunched an initiative with EY which is our campus teams initiative. And because we have over 15 locations across the UK with many different service lines, I think I already referenced the complexity. 
my uh, student recruitment team can't be everywhere all the time. So what we actually do is have teams of volunteers within the business who are going out and doing localised activity with specific universities. Now, that may be a careers fair, that may be a guest lecture, that may be a workshop, anything that we can do to get in front of um, key, key people within a university or other facet. I, I think the key for me with all of this, you have to have the buy-in from senior management and you need you need you what we call them as partner sponsors you need someone in the business who's going to help drive that message internally so i guess my challenge to everyone on the call would be is do you know who your partner sponsors or senior manager sponsors are who are really going to help drive that message forward and the other thing which a lot of companies take for granted is the people that put their hands up to volunteer may be the keen people but are they the best people to represent your brand in the marketplace. So how are you, this is an audit, how are you auditing your volunteers? Because again, you can't be at every single event. And, and do you know who your best people are who are representing the brand? And are you giving them, I love the phrase that was used about, you know, the, the tools to your your team to, to, to really excel and, and do all your volunteers have the tools to really help with your talent attraction campaigns? But the referral piece is, absolutely critical as as well absolutely critical because if you just rely on traditional pipelines you're just not going to fill you're not going to fill your vacancies because how do you connect with those people who aren't on social media who aren't the ones who attend all the careers fairs who have all the connections which could be some some hidden gems so yeah i would say mobilizing the referrals is is mission critical too great thank you um a question for everybody here um what is the biggest challenge for inclusive recruitment and how have you overcome that? So Graham, we'll just start with you since you were there. So the biggest challenge for inclusive. The biggest recruitment. challenge. Biggest challenge. I think we have we have a whole host of a whole host of challenges. I think that we find what I see a lot in the industry as a challenge for um for inclusive recruitment. I, I wouldn't necessarily this is the biggest challenge, but this is something that I see a lot, especially in the early career space, is diversity targets that companies set. A kind of blanket diversity targets so they'll be blanket across the whole market so they'll say for example in of our graduate offers this year we want to hire 10 percent black heritage candidates and that's kind of a uk-wide message when they haven't taken into the fact that you know the actual black heritage talent pools in Aberdeen for example uh are something along the lines of kind of two percent and so you're not really being realistic and I think like with all these things, for me, are you holding your recruitment teams accountable for what you're trying to do from a diversity diversity perspective? So to give you some context there, if, if your key diversity goal for the year is to um, get to gender parity, for example, or 50-50, is every single piece of your attraction and activity geared up to that? Or are you just doing some tokenistic let's run an event on International Women's Day. Because I can promise you now, if you're just hosting a webinar on International Women's Day, that's not going to increase your gender inclusive inclusivity hiring up to where you need to be. So are you actually put, taking action and taking logical steps towards that? Or are you being a little bit tokenistic? And that's what I see a lot in the market across. So I don't know if that's the biggest challenge, a little bit of a rant, no, that's or just Thank some you. things I see, but I just those those are some thoughts I have on that. Over Thank over you. to the others. I'll, um, I'm actually just going to say that we're actually out of time for questions and answers. But thank you, Graham, for that um, <laughs> for the answer to that one. I didn't realise we're so caught up in taking questions. Uh, so apologies to those whose question hasn't been answered. Um, you can find just on the slide that's there just now um, for more helpful resources. So if you go on to our employer hub, you'll see there employers.sds.co.uk. We do have a whole section on talent attraction. So you might find that your answer to your question lies within that. So I'd encourage you to look at that. We also have apprenticeship.scot that you can go on to as well. Um, we have My World of Work, findbusinesssupport.gov and the Fair Work Employer Support Tool, which is really all helpful resources there for you for looking at talent attraction. I feel like I'm going a lot faster now just because I've noticed the time. Um, one tool that we do have that um, a few of our presenters have used is a tool called Skills for Growth. 
Um, Skills for Growth is a fully funded skills diagnostic service where we can work with you as an SDS um, with you to understand your skills needs and uh, within the business. We can assess your skills gaps by speaking with your staff and creating a bespoke detailed people skill action plan. Once we have that action plan, we would then work with you to address these skills gaps and to guide you to the right support. We are a small team, um, if you can move on one, uh, a small team of seven, but you can have a look in the map there and see where we're all based. Our contact details are all there and this slide deck will be sent out as well later. Um, so you can have a look if you want to get in touch. You can also use our employer hub that I mentioned before um, on the previous slide um, and you'd be able to go on there and submit an online submission form if you wanted to ask a question or get somebody to be in touch with you. Next slide, Amy. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for our presenters. And I hope everybody in the call has got something they can take away from it. Um, and they've learned a lot from today, especially hearing from such three great businesses and how they've kind of overcome their talent attraction. Well, have they overcome? There's always a there's always a challenge with talent attraction, but how they continue to overcome um, challenges with talent attraction. Our next webinar is on the 20th of February, so hope you can join us then. Um, and that is wellbeing at work and key management skills for a thriving workforce. Thank you, everybody, for your time today. I hope you've learned something great from it and taken it away and thanks again to our presenters thank you everybody thank you.